Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Sacktown Movie Buffs. Once again, I'm Kier, and this is Jason. And uh, today we are back again with uh, we're doing another interview. Um, if you've caught one of our previous shows, we actually did a full length about our discussion on a film that uh, we found on Amazon Prime via Shutter, uh, which was called In Search of Darkness. Um, uh, it's like a f about four hour documentary. Jason, four and a half, four and a half counting credits. Yeah, four yeah. and a half counting credits. Um, and then they've also come out with a part two, which I personally haven't seen yet. Um, but Jason owns a copy already. And a, uh, but like I said, I definitely enjoyed the first part. I believe you, you were a big fan of the second part as well. Oh, yes, very much, very much. Maybe even more than the first one. Really, really. Because they had a lot of unique films on there, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, right? There was like a lot of like more foreign films. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, we'll get into that later, I'm sure. But uh, the second part, uh, does, the way I look at it, part one was a lot of heavy hitters, you know, undisputed classics with a few uh, hidden gems in there. And then the second part goes, it's much more of a deep dive into horror, a lot of, uh, a lot of the deep cuts or more of a focus on those. Got it. Well, today we are, well, the purpose of today is actually we are back. We actually were able to get a hold of uh, the director, who is uh, David Weiner, uh, who actually directed both part one and part two. And so we were just going to talk with him for a little bit and ask him a, a series of questions in terms of, uh, you know, inspiration for the films and that kind of stuff, get a little bit more information about his background. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this uh, image down and then I will bring him in here shortly. So we'll go ahead and hide that. I'm going to bring you down just for a second as well, Jason. And then we will bring in David. And there he is. <laughs> How are you doing today, David? Hey, guys. How are you doing? Good, good. So we're going to bring Jason back in here, which always takes a second. And there Jason is. <laughs> so uh, we thank you again for uh, uh, doing this for us. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we, we definitely uh, we're, we're very, very big fans of the film. And so we, you know, just wanted to just kind of talk with you a little bit about kind of your inspiration uh, for making both parts. I, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're a big horror fan. First off the gate. M mild to major. Okay. <laughs> <in between. laughs> right. Yeah, that, that, that's an understatement. I'm a huge horror fan. And uh, I love the genre, uh, although my interest goes way beyond just the 80s, just just to, uh, you know, a, a, uh, my, my horror, my horror appreciation goes back to the earliest days of it. And I was a kid uh, growing up in, in uh, watching 70s TV. Uh, a small black and white TV. I saw the Universal Horror Monster movies and Godzilla movies and Roger Corman B movies and everything in between and everything from the atomic age that was right in front of my face. And so whether it was horror or sci-fi or fantasy, Sinbad movies, Harryhausen, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm that kid who grew up to appreciate a whole subgenre of movies. And I'm Perfect. so very, very lucky to be able to make movies about a very particular decade that a lot of people are very enamored with. Yeah, you know, um, you know, from my experience, and like I said, we're we're both horror fans. Jason, even more so than I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm kind of an action junkie, but I, I love horror as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, we, we you know we're both kind of '80s babies. We kind of grew up in the '80s, and so for us, that was kind of like the golden age classic you know, horror films for us for the most part. Not to say we didn't love films from the 70s and the 60s and obviously up until today. Uh, but most of my staples, the, the Fright Nights and the Lost Boys and, and you know, all of those films all kind of took place during that time. So those were kind of the films that I, I personally grew up with and gravitated towards and were always some of my, my most uh, uh, favorite films, the ones that I own in my personal collection. And so, um, you know, my first question for you was, was uh, you know, obviously the first documentary focus mostly, you know, on the 80s for, for the most part, we dipped a little bit into the 90s and, and that sort of stuff. But uh, what what was the inspiration for, for I guess, both parts of the films kind of? Well, it, it stems from the executive producer, Robin Block. Uh, this is his project. He's based in the UK right. and he loves these movies as much as we all do. Yeah. Uh, and he thought, how cool would it be? Because he thought to, thought to himself, you know, there there's plenty of horror documentaries out there that really span the history of horror or span a, a particular niche, you know, within the genre, slasher movies and things like that, um, makeup even. And he just thought, well, how cool, I, I don't think I've seen anything that just focuses only on the 80s. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, my background, uh, I have an entertainment journalism background and I was the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. 
Um, I worked for Entertainment Tonight and The Hollywood Reporter doing lots of uh, interviews with filmmakers and stars and, and people of interest. And so the stars really kind of aligned when I met Robin, who enlisted me uh, to sort of turn his vision into a reality. And so uh, I, I helped, uh, he had it, he said, I want to make a movie about 80s horror movies that, that captures the nostalgia and passion that we all have for this. Um, how do we do this? I, I want to go year. I want to go year by year, movie by movie. And I said, that sounds amazing. <laughs> we will never fit it in one film. So right. we got to figure out how to structure it uh, and see how we can accommodate that as best as possible. Uh, and that's kind of what we did. You know, we went, you know, 80 to 80, 80 to 89, I decided to put chapters in between for larger context mm -hmm. uh, topics. And, and for me, that was important, not only just to provide context, but it was also important for me to, to be able to cast a wider net. Cause I know if we went movie by movie, we would never be able to do it. It's just right. not possible. Yeah. There's so much amazing content that came out in the eighties, whether it was theatrical or straight to video or, you know, somewhere in between in somebody's mm -hmm. basement with a video camera. We right. all got to see it at the video store at one point or another. Um, and yeah, you know, you know, one other element I'll mention, and I'll just sort of because this is now becoming a long answer, but it's um, no, you're fine. there's just so much, there's just so much material there, and and uh, I was overwhelmed with how much I would be able to tackle, and so I made a difficult decision for the first one, uh, not knowing I'd ever get to do a second one or even more. Uh, I just was like, I'm going to focus on North American films, you know, in English speaking films, even if it's dubbed, I'll just be like just. Uh, U.S. films or North American films, you know, I, I love Italian horror. I love Japanese horror. Uh, I love, you know, Hong Kong horror. Um, but I just figured it's just too, too much. It's too much. And so that was um, something that I was happily able to rectify when I got to a chance because In Search of Darkness Part 1 did so well. And people said, give us more. We want to watch another four hours if you give it to us. Right. I'm like, great. Now I can like do the deep dive and do a lot more sort of obscure titles, eccentric titles, uh, uh, European and world horror. Um, and, and there's still plenty to be covered that I didn't even touch upon in part two. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I know that was one of the things that uh, we watched it and because um, it, it um, I had to watch it more like kind of like a mini series because I just didn't have the time to trace to watch four and a half. So all at once. It's, a, it's, a, it's um, a tall drink of water. I do. I yeah. Do understand yeah so i watched it kind of more like a mini series um but i i know that when we came away i you guys did i think i think i would say in in my personal opinion it was like about 80 percent of the films that i had seen made its way onto the first documentary and then from, from my understanding jason said that maybe the last 20 percent uh, or so or at least 15 percent or so was in the second documentary so mm -hmm. well um first of all you answered a whole lot of my questions right there already because i I, I really love the structure of it, the way it went from year to year. Um, to me, that makes it so easy to watch. You know, it's just so engaging. And I've watched, I watched, of course, I watched them right when I got them, of course. And then when I found out we were doing this interview, I watched them both all over again uh, this week. And it's just, it's such an easy watch. You know, like you mentioned, there are so many documentaries about horror movies. Every day, it seems like something else pops up on Amazon Prime that's a documentary about the Power Glove or arcades or, I mean... And I watch so many of them, and they're so, you know, I enjoy all of them, but these documentaries were really something special, I thought. And, uh, you know, um, I kind of well, lost my train of thought there. But. Well, well, well <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very much. I'd really love to know why they're special to you. Like, what, what separates this from the other stuff that's out there? Like, why, why does it speak to you? Um, well, I think largely just because of the amount of films covered, uh, the diversity of films covered, especially now adding in part two. Um, and I love so much that all of you, uh, the, the effort you took to make it a really immersive experience with the physical media aspect. Because as you can see behind me, I'm a physical media fan. Uh, so the Blu-ray was important to me, obviously. Um, I love that there's those alternate posters included. Uh, the posters are all beautiful. Um, I have the soundtracks for both now. I mean, it's a full-on immersive experience. And uh, it's more than just like, you know, and I, like I said, I like those other documentaries. I find like 90 minute easy watch, you know, when I, when I can't think of anything else to watch sometimes. But these were like, I don't know, they were special for me. So uh, I, 
just want to get that out of there first. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy. <laughs> I, I I really appreciate that. I think I think this this speaks to all of us in that uh, the people who are really responding to it positively. Um, it's that it's that sort of you know f- the nostalgia of familiarity, um, yeah. and and it's sort of a an, an especially the first time you're watching it, you get to say, oh, I know that movie. Oh, I mm-hmm. always wanted to know more about that movie. Oh, mm-hmm. I never heard about that movie. Right. You know, uh, you're following the wall of posters, and what are we going to land on? Is it going to be on the film that I love the most? Right. And and a good friend of mine who saw an early cut of. Uh, part one, um, I remember he, he pointed out, you know, you never covered the movie that I love the most, but there was one time where it was the poster that was right next to a movie that landed there. <laughs> and the fact that yeah. you had my poster of the movie that I love so much there as acknowledgement that it's out there. And it's just one more thing that people could explore and tackle and discover for themselves that's okay, you know, because you can't do it all. And I think a lot of people sort of get myopic where they're like, well, you didn't get my movie, you know, how come? That, that, that's a travesty, <laughs> you know? But 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 I think uh, the way I designed this movie is that even if we don't cover, you know, do an actual segment on the movie that is might be your favorite or one that you want to know more about, um, you know, we really do cast a wider net in these other uh, chapters that at least can touch upon it, where you can at least have a visual reference, a verbal reference, you know, some sort of connection to it, where at least it, it's a recognition that it's out there. And just in terms of the overall genre and the output, um, it's just, it, it was a magical time. And we all connect to it because these movies not only were movies that we saw, but a lot of times our story is how we saw it, how we probably shouldn't have seen it, mm-hmm. you know, how we snuck in and saw it, how our right. friend had a bootleg of it, how we right. saw it on cable at two in the morning, right. how we asked someone to get us into a rated R movie if we buy them popcorn, perhaps maybe someone did that once, you know, right. um, mm-hmm. just to get in a rated R film. And uh, so a lot of these movies, even if the movie itself is not so spectacular, there are moments that really we connect to uh, and the story around seeing it, whether it was with our friends or whether it was just a special experience for us or it provided that that comfort or distraction during a difficult time, perhaps, in our lives. Um, that's all part of the story, you know, uh, the medium, how, how we saw it, whether it was in the theater or VHS or cable or laser disc, you know. Um, but when I when I showed this movie at Beyond Fest, I knew that four and a half hours was a long sit. So I showed it in two parts. You know, it was sort of two hours, then you got an intermission, then another two hours. And uh, it was the first time we were showing it on the big screen. And when we hit intermission, because this is a movie that's just, it's easy to break up, but there's still a free flow that I had to right. do something. Um, my editor, Sam Way, who does such an amazing job with this, we, we grabbed that image of the laser disc where you have an upside down turtle telling you that you have to flip the laser disc. And we popped that in and we wanted people to like, that would be their, their indicator. That, you know, <laughs> right. that you Old nostalgia laser disc. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, to your point, I mean, I think that, that what makes the eighties kind of so special and magical, not just because, you know, well, Jason, and I grew up, in that time period. And that's when we really kind of get it, got in. We were born late seventies, but we, you know, grew up in the eighties. Um, but it, it, it kind of was, uh, the golden age, especially for horror, because they still use the, uh, the, the, the actual, you know, uh, uh they didn't use all the special effects. The and practical, kinda, practical effects era, right? Yeah. And, and so you could kind of see how it got closer to the nineties when special effects started to become more featured. And then obviously now you're getting into the nineties and it's all, pretty much CGI and into the 2000s CGI and stuff like that. And so we like the, the the practical special effects that were still really scary and terrifying, you know, and they use the real makeup and they use the, the real claymation or the real molds and stuff like that. And so, and so you just, that's just kind of a, a unique thing for one. And then two, um, I felt like the eighties was when you really started to see like the genres of horror and action and, and slasher and and all those terms started to come sci-fi. into the fold and sci-fi started to come yeah. into fold in the 80s as well because before that and blending together yeah. and blending together and and that sort of stuff where you're now you have this 
action horror or you have this sci-fi horror and that sort of stuff. And those terms weren't really used as much. I feel like in the seventies and sixties and before then, I feel like the eighties is when they really started to culminate all those. Oh yeah. They really started to sort of genre straddle, you know, a lot of people were like, well, where's, why isn't aliens in, in search of darkness? And I was like, well, that's, that's a valid question. You know, I, I, it's all how you see it. Cause that movie is a, is a, just a pure hybrid of sci-fi action and horror mm -hmm. you know um what is it what's the what's the the top you know box that you want to choose for me right. it's sci-fi yeah. with action and horror right. um but everyone sees everything differently and I, I think what's what's cool about in the 80s is that uh exactly to your point i, I think the there the slasher genre for example started to get a little played out because people are like all right so you got a body count and it's a mystery or not you know, who's the killer or we know who the killer is and how creative are the kills going to be. Right. Um, but then you have something like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street comes along where you just it's more fantasy. It's more it's more playing with it's more of a mind F. I don't know if I could, you know, yeah. curse my <laughs> podcast, but, but but it but it 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 took this i you know the idea that you could have this sort of killer but he's unattainable because he's mm -hmm. only in your dreams is i think a really wonderful concept right i think people looked at a certain certain benchmark films whether it was american werewolf or nightmare mm -hmm. on elm street where other filmmakers said oh you could do that right, i didn't right. know you could do that and you could right. do that with that and you could buy that and put it on a film you know on film right you know for the practical effects let's do that you know, I think it's interesting you were talking about how, you know, it was the it was the decade of the practical effects explosion. Mm -hmm. You know, there were practical effects, uh, wonderful ones, uh, pioneered before then. But this was really the decade where you really believed you, that a lot of these things, yeah. you know, at the time they felt very real. You know, now you look at them, they're right. a little more yeah. quaint. But but I think I think yeah. what's interesting, you know, lastly, I'll say about the practical effects explosion is that once you hit the 90s, you know, the novelty of CGI and what you could do with it, what people got very excited about the possibilities and the potential of that. And I think uh, I think Jurassic Park is is the prime offender of confusing people in terms of how CGI is done, mm -hmm. because a lot of people back then and maybe even now, depending on who you are, think that those dinosaurs were like 90 90 percent to 100 percent CGI. And they said, wow, you could do that all and make a real dinosaur. Uh, I want that in my film. And then all of a sudden everyone wants only CGI. But what right. they did not realize is that that was mostly practical effects mm -hmm. with strategic CGI in certain places. And so the way it was edited and the way it was assembled and the fact that you had this magical CGI moments to sort of deliver the the context of the goods, of the, mon of the dinosaurs and the creatures, um, people miss misconstrued that as all CGI and that's what they wanted for their own movies if you're they were producers so next thing you know it's a CGI explosion in the 90s and right. we're quickly realizing that these aren't tangible and on screen and the actors interacting with them it's not in the same plane there's a there's no weight to them right and without getting too granular about all that kind of stuff I think we're we're watching as an audience saying oh that's cool oh that's cool oh wait that looks completely fake. Uh, right. well, now they're right. going over the top with it. Now I'm just not feeling it. And then right. the pendulum ultimately kind of swung back when people were realizing that, especially with, you know, J.J. Abrams, like doing Force Awakens, where he's just like, we will have, you know, pre we will have models and we will have practical effects because if it's all CGI, like the, you know, the prequel trilogy, people are going to feel like it's a video game. Yeah. So no, I agree. Incredibly yeah. tangential, but uh, it's interesting to see the evolution of perception of that stuff. Yeah. Because even, even now, I mean, you know, even though CGI has gotten so much better now, and to some point you can't tell, but you can still tell in many instances that this is a bunch of guys running around in front of a blue screen or, or, or green screen. And, 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 you know, and it just, it, it, not to say that it cheapens the feel for me, but it definitely. I, when I notice it, it definitely is just like, man, I wish when they used to just do this stuff for real, you know what I mean? There's nothing, or or whenever I watch the making of and you see these guys just 
running around and like there's nothing but green screen around them. You know what I mean? They with dots all over them. Yeah, yeah, with dots all over them, and you're just like, yeah. you know, like it, I was like, how fun could that be for for an actor? You know what I mean? You yeah. you have no clue. You're just running around and like all this, you know, green screen and that kind of stuff. So there's something to be said about the '80s and that time period, and in terms of you know what they were what they were able to do with with you know, and and I get it. It's time consuming to make all the makeup and the molds and the busts and all that kind of stuff to make these these these, these great specs, but there's something to be said when it comes on the big screen and you get to see those imagery and, and you're still terrified by that. You know what I mean? And so I, I just, I don't know. I, I'm just a proponent of, of using, you know, real made props and things of that nature. I, I will happily take a, a uh, rubber monster over a CGI monster any day of the week. Any, even yeah. though oh, yeah. I know it's a, a, a puppet or a, a person in a suit. Just because I, I'm like, they, they took the time to craft it, to do their best to make it realistic, and it's there, and mm -hmm. they're interacting with it. And um, I, 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 like I used the word quaint before, but it, I'm fine with that. Yeah. You know, because the whole thing, I mean, listen, if you're going to, if you're going to nitpick certain things, but you're not going to, you're going to buy a, a, an outlandish, unrealistic premise, but you're not going to suspend your disbelief for a monster. Okay, and you believe everything else, but you right, don't believe right. that. Well, you gotta, you gotta sort of buy the whole dinner, you know. I agree. Yeah, if right. the premise yeah. is set up as is this 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 fake fantasy monster world, but you know what I mean. But you can't believe that you know this is a real monster in front of your face. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's. No, I agree. Yeah, there's there's really something to be said for taking the effort, like you said, and you know, I I yeah, I have nothing against really quality CGI, I guess, but. Like, for instance, I had, a, like, a really strange reaction to that new version of the Jungle Book. I don't know if you saw that, but they were, they were like, touting the fact that um, the entire movie, everything you see is CGI except for the boy. So when I watched it, I was, like, I had a really strange reaction to it. It was almost like an Uncanny Valley effect. Like, you know, it was, like, nothing felt, I couldn't, like, I couldn't feel like I could connect with anything in that movie. And, you know, yes, I can say that it's impressive, the CGI is impressive, but it didn't feel like a, a, anything that I could become involved in. You know, it just felt fake to me. That, that, that to me for me, there are certain, uh, again, sort of milestone steps in the evolution of special effects. Uh, that one is one of them where I, I, listen, there are so many examples, <laughs> but you look at something like uh, um, the Polar Express, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. working mo motion capture and it all looks amazing, but the, the eyes are dead and it just takes you out, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and I can't watch it because of that. Jungle Book to me was sort of like a, another, not the next step, but another step in the evolution of it's all in, you know, CGI. At first it's a little jarring, but for me, I was just incredibly intrigued in trying to figure out, well, if it's all in camera, so much of it looks real, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, sorry, so much of it looks real. There are real elements, but you, you know, trying to figure out what is real and what is completely CGI when you don't know what is being manufactured in, right. uh, in, in you know, CGI is really interesting. And so then you get to like, say the Mandalorian, for example, mm -hmm. where now, you know, a, a lot of it is very practical, but a lot of that is also completely fabricated environments in a soundstage, but there's lots of rear projection uh, 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 in these environments where they're walking through sets that are practical in there. And that sells the idea that there's something actually there and they're in costume and they're on there, but everything else is, is a pre-rendered projection. Right. So the whole thing does look like a digital painting now, but there is a different semblance of it being real. And John Favreau kind of pioneered that progressively, whether it was Jungle Book or Lion King or now Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my, it, it, we could get into the weeds with all that stuff, but right. I, I think you either connect to it or you don't based yeah. on are, are, are you telling yeah. a good story? Are there compelling moments? Is, right. that, is, yeah. the, is the music, is the concept, is the acting, is the, is the presentation, right. is the interaction of props and, and 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 settings selling you this story are you in, are you invested or not and that's sort of what it comes down to and you know to bring it all back to the 80s that was all <laughs> real that was all in yeah, camera yeah. you know and absolutely. so whatever they presented to you you were just you bought it because you wanted to see that scenario and you didn't i'll, I'll sorry there was one last thing because we're in complete tangent territory but like yeah. 
the things the things that I mentioned I think are uh, work well is because there's a whole environment that's all integrated well. But then you have Call of the Wild, where you have a CGI dog with Harrison Ford, right? Where yeah. everything is real except the dog. Right. And then you're just uh, boy, I saw some of that, and I was just like, I would have killed to see a trained dog in this movie, you know? Because I just yeah. I just don't know what I'm seeing now, you know? Yeah, no, no, yeah, no. I it, saw- I happened to catch part of that too, like on TV and it was like, and you could tell they did that because they wanted the dog to like react, you know, have facial expressions or, and it just, it just felt lazy to me. I don't know. You know, Benji I, I did it. Win Tin Tin did it. Lassie right. did yeah. it. Yeah, Why can't just, we do it now? Yeah. We, we don't right. want to take the time to train the dogs. <laughs> Luke who's talking did it. They had real babies. They just, you know, sweetened with the lips with animation and CGI. Yeah. I don't know. There's a way of doing it where it's in yeah. camera and making it believable. But hey, aren't we here to talk about uh, horror, eighties horror? Right, right, right. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> absolutely. sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm yeah, really no. responsible for derailing this. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. And, and like I said, and that's kind of our style. We kind of free form. So whatever topics come up, we just we just tend to roll with it. Um, so yeah, so you, you you did both parts, part one, part two, um, and then I know that you, you're the questions are coming. You know, are we doing a '90s? Are we doing a 2000s? What's going on with that? So, I'd, would you? I'd want to see a part three of '80s, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> so much. What would you if if we do part three, which we are planning to do? What would you like to see in In Search of Darkness, part three? Uh, the gate. The gate. Uh, right off the top of my head, yeah, the gate. Um, House on Sorority Row. Um, of course, my mind is going blank now. But You're right. Um, you know, when I first heard there was going to be the first one, I was like, four hours, oh, man, they're going to get all of them. You know, and then <laughs> part two, even part two, it's flying by so many posters. That I'm like, wait, wait, go back, go back, you know. Jeez. Um, <laughs> oh, man. See, I knew I should have prepared a list if you were going to well, well, The gate, the gate part was three. in part two and it didn't make the cut. Uh, I, that, uh, unfortunately, with the, with the physical media, I can't really go beyond four and a half hours. Otherwise, yeah. the, uh, the, the image gets all, it, it just, there's, you know, uh, the quality of the image, uh, you know, does, is worse. I've lost my ability to articulate myself now. But, um, <laughs> and, but, but so I had a, like an additional hour of uh, material that was, you know, done or mostly done uh, in a rough cut that, you know, I had to kill a lot of babies regretfully. And there were a lot of movies. I mean, like I, I have a coworker who's, who champions extra and loves extra. And I'm like, I'm doing extra for you. It's going to happen. And, and <laughs> yeah. I did it and I had it in there and it wasn't as robust as I wanted it to be. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to try again another time. But I, I had to let him down easy. <laughs> but yeah, we, 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 we're planning on doing a In Search of Darkness 3. Okay. Uh, we are planning on doing In Search of Darkness 90s Okay. Uh, and getting that started. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, In Search of Tomorrow, which is all about 80s right. sci-fi movies. Um, and uh, In Search of Pixels, which is about retro gaming. Um, creator okay. VC, which is Robin Block. He's the executive producer. Right. His... his um, He's got this master plan to create all this wonderful stuff in the vein of what we've been doing with starting with In Search of the Last Action Heroes. Right. Which I know, you know, I think you saw that care, right? Yeah, yeah. We both saw that. We did a show on that one as well. Um, I, I loved it. You know, he's he's more into uh, uh, horror, so he didn't love it quite as much as the the In Search of, of Darkness films. And he and to his point, um, it was it was a much shorter uh, uh, film. Uh-huh. Um, so they weren't able to cover n- barely any as much as you guys were able to get in, in both of your films, which which I will have to concede as well. So yeah, yeah, well, it was it was really good. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, but the you know I'm I'm I've I've been a horror kid ever since I was you know seven six seven years old. Um, so that's my thing, and I just love the like I said like the the linear year by year structure and the posters and the soundtracks and the Blu rays and. That 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 sold me big time. So, <laughs> so you so you're really enjoying because you like the physical media. You're really appreciating the sort of above and beyond packaging of the movie. Um, and there's also the you know the Discord community as well um, that's available to so anyone who's getting these movies 
has access to uh, In Search of Darkness Discord community, so you can watch watch parties and you know interact with uh, fellow fans and collectors and stuff like that. I don't know if you, if you if you've done yeah, that. I, I engage a little bit. I, I manage our our uh, most of our social media, and so I see a lot of those groups and like on Instagram, they have little groups for that. And so yeah, it is really really cool if you want to engage with other people that are big time you know, in search of darkness fans or horror fans and that sort of stuff. And so a lot of people are, are engaging. I've even seen some, some conversations where people are like uh, mailing movies to each other mm -hmm. that are like in physical media. Okay. Like, so people are actually like, well, if you send me this, I'll send you this. And so it's a, it's a great little community and experience as well for other like horror fans that can get together and kind of engage and, and have watch parties and stuff like that, especially during COVID. Uh, they're doing like these zoom parties where they all watch the, the same film at the same time via zoom and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's pretty we have we have someone from the movie or an expert on the movie and stuff like that. And, right. and that's been very, very cool because it's really, you know, these documentaries take a long time to produce. Right. And we're all stuck at home, you know, more or less. And uh, I think it, it, now more than ever, having an opportunity and the technology to be able to connect um, in between the releases of these films uh, and connect with all the fellow fans and just share the stuff that you love. I think it's a great, um, experience that, that sort of extends the documentary experience. So anyway. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Well, great. Well, did you have any other final questions, Jason? Oh yeah. I think I, I, I don't know much about the discord community actually. So I have a lot of people asking me uh, that they, you know, they see, I don't know if you're familiar with letterbox at mm -hmm. all. It's yeah. Um, you know, I posted my review of in search of darkness too. And I got lots of people asking me, where, you know, is this still available? Where can they find it? People asking me if this one's going to pop up on Shutter, like the first one. Do you do you want to explain some of that, maybe? Or yeah, sure. So the way we do this is we, you know, we this is an indie company, and we we crowdfund these ourselves. So, you know, Kickstarter or Indiegogo or just a a, a backer campaign. And what we what we did with the first one, we've done with the second one, where uh, in October we ran this. Uh, pretty much a month long cam campaign ending on Halloween, where if you back, you get all the cool stuff that, that you got, Jason, you know, the, the, you know, the posters and the movie and the soundtrack and the digital downloads and, you know, uh, you know, enamel pin and all this fun and cool stuff and access to the discord community. Um, and you get your name in the credits, which is super fun and super cool as well. And pretty unique. I don't know who else is offering that opportunity. Um, I've never but, seen it before. So yeah, <laughs> when he told me about it, I was like, man, I should have jumped on that. <laughs> but, but then of course people were like, well, I missed it. And I'm like, well, we know we miss it. You know, you've missed it. But we, you know, we, we manufacture this in batches. Um, yeah. It's not like we have some big warehouse where you just say, all right, you want it, we'll fulfill it. You know, uh, right. but the good news is that uh, we are having a flash sale uh, from February 5th through February 14th. Uh, so next week. Um, and uh, if you don't have the film, it's your opportunity to get the film. The only difference is that you can't get the name of the credits, but you get all the other cool stuff. Yeah. So if you did it, if you backed in October, you get the privilege of having your name in the credits. Uh, this time around, you get everything that everyone else got, which is super cool because we want you know, people were demanding it. They're like, I missed it. I really wanted it. Or I didn't have the money last time, but I had, you know, the, the, the paycheck came in, you know, and now I can, you know, buy it. And so um, we're happy to make it uh, available again for a limited time from February 5th to the 14th. So just go to 80shorrordoc.com or go to our socials, which is at 80shorrordoc, and uh, you'll find out how to get it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. I'll let I'll let all my friends know for sure. <laughs> please do. Please do. You yeah, know, yeah. and and yeah, spread the word. You know, I mean, I appreciate you having me on yeah. to talk about this stuff. I mean, if you if you have any other last questions, that's totally cool. I. I'm home too, so I have nowhere to go. <laughs> you're not, you're not in a hurry, you're not in a rush. Yeah, we, we, we do try to be respectful of people's time. We we try to keep it, you know, is is sweet. But if it goes a little over, we don't mind either. Yeah. Um, but no, no, great. Um, um, I didn't have any further questions. I don't know if Jason. I think that you got a lot of yours answered. Did you or one thing I was wondering about, um, as far as how the interview subjects are selected, I was just curious. A lot of them are obviously filmmakers, actors, special effects artists. I was just curious, like, how does the word get around to, say, Corey Taylor of Slipknot or Chris Jericho? How do they get involved? You know what I mean? Like, they had really great insight. I was just wondering how 
like how does the word get out that they you know that they want to be in it or you want them to be in it you know i was just curious about that it's a good question um for each of them um well like chris jericho uh uh so you know you have we have close to for those people who aren't familiar with these films we have uh, you know, uh, for the first film, we had uh, almost 50 people, uh, whether they were, you know, John Carpenter or uh, Heather Langenkamp or, you know, filmmakers, actors, special effects people, mm -hmm. journalists, influencers, uh, uh, composers. I mean, I, I really tried to do a widespread. Mm -hmm. But part of it was also people who were just very influenced uh, and big fans. Uh, but yeah. also well-known individuals, and they have their own reach. And so, um, you know, we, we have uh, Joe Bob Briggs and Darcy from uh, The Last Drive-In there. Um, and Darcy, uh, for the first film, she's like, oh, you you got to get Chris Jericho in this movie. He's a, he's just a huge nut and a huge <laughs> horror nut, not a huge nut. He's a huge horror nut. And uh, he, he's got so much to say and so much to offer. And so we weren't able to get him in the first one, but we wanted to get him in the second one. And that's really kind of, you know, I mean, there's there's obvious crossover with the wrestling crowd, you know, and the and the music crowd. You know, he's got his, he's got, a, you know, a rock band. He's a he's a wrestler. He's a podcaster. Mm -hmm. um, he's he's known uh, for horror and for a variety of things. And so uh, just, you know, and he's a great interview and he's extremely knowledgeable and he's very uh -huh. entertaining. So. Right. For all, all the, you know, he checks so many boxes. And so he's an obvious uh, uh, asset to In Search of Darkness mm -hmm. Part Two. Uh, Corey Taylor is an interesting one because um, Corey Taylor, lead singer, singer of Slipknot, he's a big horror fan as well. You know, I mean, his one of the masks that he wore on stage was designed by Tom Savini. Um, you know, oh. yeah, yeah, he's really yeah. into it. And um, both he and Darcy, were backers of the project. Okay. And there and there there was when we did the first project, we had a highest tier backer where if you if you're the highest tier backer, uh you can get interviewed on and be in the movie. Uh we didn't offer that for part two, but we did offer that for part one. And so we did that uh for three individuals. And two of them happened to be Darcy from The Last Drive-In. What, what are the odds? And then the other one was uh, Corey Taylor. Mm. And so the thing is with Corey Taylor, you know, we didn't know it was him. Um, and Robin Block sort of reached out saying, you know, thank you for backing, you know, love to talk to you, you know, about, you know, getting your interview and, you know, putting you in the film. You know, who are you? And, he, and Corey Taylor's like, oh, no, they're going to find out who I am. Because he didn't know, he didn't even know that he was going to be on camera. Um, huh. I don't think, I don't think Darcy knew either. They just wanted to support the project. And they wanted to support, they saw it popping up on Kickstarter. And they said, support a cool project. And they're like, this is awesome. I love horror. Support it. They didn't realize that they, in the top tier that they were so, you know, uh, uh, backing puts them on camera. Mm. Anyway, so Corey Taylor turns out to be the most entertaining and knowledgeable and uh -huh. charismatic guy and you know it just was um serendipitous you know and we ended up doing a collector's edition for him and we ended up doing a collector's edition for uh uh chris jericho awesome well that's nice that thank is, you yeah 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 no, that is really cool and thanks for explaining that for us for sure so. i think I, I think they they add some real entertaining uh commentary to what's going on because i think both of them um very much uh, Corey as well. Uh, they they really reflect the Uber fan, you know, that's watching these uh -huh. things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, while they might not necessarily be part of the industry, they grew up watching these just like we did, and they were affected so adversely in a positive way uh, in terms of changing their their sort of course correction and their trajectory in their life of what they love and what they you know want to emulate and and so on and so forth. And so having them as a mouthpiece, knowledgeable as well about these films, but really connecting just as the, the ultimate true fan, you know, that was, a, that was a wonderful, unexpected treat for both of these films. Perfect. Yeah, that's another thing that makes those, these so special, I think, is their an examination of the genre from within the genre and outside the genre as a fan. So it's just, yeah, just wonderful. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Well, cool. Well, um, I think that's all the questions that we had for you. We, we definitely, uh, you know, appreciate you taking time out of your day. And I know we're all stuck at home, but still, we, we do appreciate <laughs> you available for us today. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add, David, by chance? Or? No, you know, I just want to direct everyone to uh, 80shorrordoc.com um, or the socials, whether it's, you know, Facebook or Twitter, or Instagram, it's at 80shorrordoc. Uh, we're having our flash sale for In Search of Darkness Part 2 with all the goodies um, from February 4th through the, uh, sorry, February 5th through the 14th. Uh, and so tell your friends and, you know, jump on it. Now that is your chance to do that again. And if you're interested in following my stuff on, on social media, I have my own site called It Came From Blog. Mm -hmm. So you go to itcamefromblog.com. And that's just sort of my my pop culture musings and a lot of the uh, like the interviews I've done in the past, uh, you know, for Famous Monsters or Hollywood Reporter or Entertainment Tonight or just in general, uh, that stuff is on there too. I mean, I just posted uh, uh, my uh, an interview I did with John Carpenter five years ago for Escape to Escape from New York, you awesome. know, and I, I I put that up on the site. So there's fun stuff and just sort of pop culture musings. So you can find me on Twitter at it came from blog. Or my other handle is Tiki Ambassador, because I love all things Tiki. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, again, like awesome. I said, we, we, we greatly appreciate you uh, taking time today. Um, a great interview. Um, so we definitely look forward to the, the next projects you're doing. Definitely want to see part three and uh, and, and, and beyond. So, yeah. So, uh, be, be and search of tomorrow, too. Search of tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Doing doing interviews for In Search of Tomorrow now. Despite COVID, we're making it happen. And sitting down with some folks and um, very excited, lining up some really cool uh, talent that I'm very excited about. And uh, very, it's going to be very similar to In Search of Darkness in terms of its structure and its feel. But of course, it's all focused on movies, uh, you know, sci-fi movies and, and, and <laughs> all the genre stuff that we love. You know, absolutely. Well, hopefully, we'll get we'll be able to see some aliens. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, Aliens is an action movie. I don't think. Right, 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 right. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no. It's no, like it is one of those fun. Well, especially, it is. It is. I would say it's more action, but yeah, no, it, it is. It is action, sci-fi, and horror. I, I, I'm uh, knock on wood. I'm talking to Carrie Hen, aka Newt, uh, in oh. in in a week or in two weeks. Uh, so I'm looking forward to talking with her and making all this stuff happen and putting it on, on camera. Awesome. Great. Great. Well, cool. Well, we thank you again. Uh, we definitely look forward to your upcoming projects and uh, who knows, maybe we'll, we'll have you back again and do another interview with you in the future. Uh, once some of those projects are done as well. So uh, Pierre, Jason, I really appreciate you having me on and, oh, and your enthusiasm and backing the project and, you know, uh, keep on enjoying and, and, and long live physical media, right? Absolutely. Oh yeah. yeah. We're huge fans. I yeah. don't have quite as much as he does. I'm, I'm around. <laughs> He's in the foul. Yeah, this is one of this is one of three behind me. Full yeah. show. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got a lot of catching up to do. I feel like a, a baby having six hundred <laughs> DVDs and blueprints. <laughs> this guy, <laughs> amateur hour. <laughs> no, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It's all relative yeah. to space and what you want. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, great. Well, uh, we thanks again. Uh, we 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 enjoyed the we enjoyed the conversation and the discussion. Um, as always, uh, we ask anybody watching if you if you like the channel, obviously like, subscribe, make sure you hit the bell notification for uh, any updates. And then, obviously, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, put them down in the uh, the comment section as well. And uh, we hope to be back again with another show for you guys again real soon. We thank you for watching, and we hope you have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.